many faces in here, pretty much every um, spot here and there. Um, Why does that make you laugh? Because George is looking at me going, oh my god, I can't believe you've been with the department for nine years. And I remember one of our first meetings of, um, we have this group called the Calumet Government Working Group that meets quarterly. Uh, and uh, I think originally it centered around some project problems we were having with hydrology at one of our sites called Big Marsh. Uh, and since then it kind of just formed into a group that met regularly to collaboratively work on um, kind of the whole Calumet region. Uh, and some of the faces in this room were some of the first people I saw at those meetings. And I remember being uh, a nervous intern. I had worked in billboard advertising for five years and had been going back to school to get my master's degree. And uh, George and Marv and George and, of course, all, all, all the others uh, in the room were very welcoming to me. And I felt very lucky to work on the Calumet project in particular. Uh, at the department, I, I have been the only person aside from Suzanne Malik McKenna, who's now our commissioner, working on this effort. And it's, it's a project that's really near and dear to her heart absolutely near and dear to my heart. And now we finally have an intern, Jerry Terry, who's helping us move the project forward. Uh, so from years ago, nearly a decade now, just talking about the Environmental Center as a concept, we're moving to actually making it happen and making physical changes on the ground. So things are great. And of course, it's, it's also due to the immense partnerships of all the state surveys and DNR, along many other partners. So thank you. So the Calumet region of Chicago. It really extends into Indiana, to the Indiana Dunes National Lakeshore on the east, all the way through the portion of Chicago and the south suburbs up to the INF Canal on the west. So it's a huge region covering state lines and dealing with different suburbs. Uh, we try to work as a team to make it all happen. Uh, so we try to make those lines invisible, if you will. And what's so special about the area, from my perspective, is this weird juxtaposition of nature, industry, and community. The, the natural resources of the region are immense, uh, especially when it comes to wetlands. There are huge complexes of wetlands within the city of Chicago, uh, about 3,900 acres of open space actually in that area. It's just phenomenal to have that happen in the city. Um, the industrial history of the region is unbelievable. Pretty much all the steel mills that built the major skyscrapers that fed the world for all of steel uh, historically uh, were in the Italian region of Chicago. Most of those are now gone and have left the landscape highly altered, as you can imagine. Um, and then the community that came with this, a lot of people came from foreign countries, and this was their first place living in the United States, in Chicago, to work at the steel mills. And I like this uh, picture here uh, that shows uh, what was then called Illinois Steel. There's a, a sign at the employment office, and it's in five different languages, none of them being English. So it just gives you a, a good idea of, of the diversity that was um, seen at, at that. And when we talk about the Ford Climate Environmental Center and the whole climate initiative, we're talking about not just nature. We're talking about how can nature and industry move forward, be revitalized together, hand in hand, rather than being you know, things that we perceive as bumping head, head to head and causing problems for each other that theme of coexistence. This is a great picture that just kind of is indicative of this. If anyone knows where cluster site is, this is uh, the methane um, cover system at the top of it and a red tail pop. And you see a lot of this, um, you see a little bit of disinvested community areas where jobs have, have gone. You see natural areas and you see landfills. Uh, and you see industry, heavy industry. This is the landscape of the region. So looking back in time, there used to be a series of five lakes throughout the Calumet area, and this, of course, being the Cali Calumet River, which is now a straight channelized river, and Lake Michigan here. Uh, lots of wetlands teeming with life. Um, I just read Devil in the, in the White City. And there's a, a piece in the book that talks about how they took the wetland plants by boxcar uh, to um, the, uh, the turn of the century World's Fair down, downtown. So you can imagine the diversity we're dealing with. These are modern pictures, but when I give this presentation to people who aren't familiar with the area, I like to just give them an idea of we're dealing with the great ecosystems, but historically, several different types of wetlands, forested, emergent, wet prairie. And to have all this space in the city of Chicago is just really something unique. Um, here's another quote about soldiers at Fort Dearborn. They went there hunting and fishing, finding all kinds of birds. University really shocked them. These are some pictures by Mike Jeffords from Illinois Natural History Survey uh, at the Black Crown Night Heron Mercury in the Calumet area, right next to the steel mill. Some other critters that hang out in Calumet, uh, Mike Ward at INHS is studying the yellow headed blackbirds. I just love this picture of the town warhead, it's so cute. 
and people just, that's one of the reasons right now, um, there's not a lot of amenities for people to come visit the sites, but it's birders who really are finding their way into the region to come check this stuff out. Lots of great birders. Plants as well. We have some endangered sedges at various sites. Uh, but really, what really got people excited, and if you're uh, familiar with Swink and Wilhelm and their work on the plants of the Chicago region, uh, at one point, historically, a plant was found here uh, that doesn't exist anywhere else in the world. It's closest relative being in New Zealand. Um, and they used to do annual hunts for this plant called Disney Americana. Again, just this incredible resource rich area in the middle of what's now industry. They still look for it and they don't find it anymore, but we still hope one day that we'll catch it. Uh, animals that used to be in the region, people really like to hear about the fact that there were otter, bison, elk uh, in the area that now, of course, disappeared. Um, some fish that were in the area, and there are still plenty of sturgeon and wolf lake. Um, they say there's one in there that's 300 plus pounds, you know, who knows if that's the case or not. Maybe it's just a little bit of drama they want to create. Um, and so another really interesting story that we'll tell at this environmental center, which I'll talk about in a minute, is you know, why did the Chicago region and the Calumet region in particular develop in this way? And it's very, very clearly a great geographic story. It's a story about a lake. It's a story about a river. Um, it's a story about how those natural resources lent to the development of railroad systems. Chicago is still the biggest railroad hub in the United States of America, the most important area. Uh, you know, there was also lots of uh, roads themselves that came in and developed the area, lots of changes to the landscape. Uh, we filled in a lot of wetlands, um, and they did, there was a lot of mining of natural resources. George can attest to the fact that at um, uh, Big Marsh and other sites, there was a lot of mining of sand and other raw materials. So one of the first big changes was uh, along the Calumet River. This is U.S. Steel, if you're building uh, a facility at the mouth of the Calumet River, just laying the, uh, the docks to put in the concrete initially for the slip. Okay. This is in 1913, just boats starting to make their way through the river. This is uh, what's called a whaleback lake, lake boat. Uh, this was a federal furnace they were just unloading. I like this shot because it gives you that image of, you know, they really kind of dealt with the waterways very much. They're still in the kind of natural state. And here are these big um, grain elevators and such building uh, right along the water. And that's in 1902 and 1915, roughly. Okay. So as time goes on, more and more businesses start making their, like, their way here. This is actually still the state, the state line power plant uh, built in 1929. Uh, facilities start going up. And as, as they do this, they start realizing that their waterway needs to be altered in a dramatic manner. Uh, and this is the channelization in roughly the 1940s of the Calumet River. This is its, one of its former channels going right through. This is actually Hybrish Marsh. And we're going to be building our environmental center right here. So, you know, what a great way to tell the story of how man has had an impact on nature than the fact that the river used to run right through our site and is now filled in. This is Lake Calumet. Um, as if you know Lake Calumet, you know that only the slips on this side were ever developed. These are not developed. Um, these are plans from uh, 1935. The, these tax labels here indicate all the businesses that developed along the river itself. And there are tons of businesses. If you, if you ever go on a boat tour of this area, you'll be in shock. There, there's not almost any square footage that isn't that is open space. All of hardcore industrial. Um, and, and the intention of the Port Authority, which manages this waterway in Lake Calumet, was really to make you know, America this water rail truck link with the world. It's a brochure from 1961. There's a lot less uh, heavy shipping traffic coming into the port now. That's uh, one of the issues we're having. Um, but again, this is uh, from the 1960s, mouth of the Calumet River. This is Cal Park, Youngstown Steel. And this is, if you're familiar with the south slope of U.S. Steel, uh, that's, that's what we're looking at. So pretty huge changes in the region. Railroads, um, I know George Ward Kevin says it's a subject uh, close to his heart, uh, and, the, and the region has such a rich history of it. Uh, you would love some of these photos that I found, George. Okay. Pullman, that's a story for a, another day. We can spend a full hour talking about Pullman's development. Uh, this is a Pullman car right here. But railroads, if you go through the area, you're just pretty much stopped all the time by active rail. And of course, the big story is steel. Uh, it started, the first plant was opened in 1875, but through 1992, very recent uh, closure was the last one. 
and the lives of just hundreds of thousands of people were made and lost in this area of Chicago. Giving you an idea of what the landscape looks like. This is the interlake Acme, 1930 to 1950, somewhere in there. I'm just giving you the scale of a big person standing up here, interlake iron. More pictures. Acme was one of the last ones to close the coking operation. This is from their, their coking facility. When Suzanne, my boss, and I went in for a tour right before they closed, it was really like taking a step back in time to the early 18, or mid 18, late 1800s. It was just a phenomenal feeling that you just couldn't believe people were still working in, in this type of operation. So dangerous. And that, the reason I like this, this slide is because people who worked in the mill say, you know, it looks nothing like it does now. It looked nothing like it does now. At night, there was smoke billowing everywhere. But they saw this as a sign of progress. They saw this as a positive thing, not necessarily as what we would see as this polluted uh, atmosphere. They saw it as they're making progress, they're making money, to have jobs, and they're supporting their families. And speaking of families, the proximity of the steel mill over here, this is U.S. steel, Residences right across the street. There's some bars that, that used to be right next to Wisconsin Steel that they call buckets of blood because the people who knew one another in the mills were buddies and they'd go after work and have beers with their little click and really they would fight with people from another bar. And uh, it was just a fascinating uh, cultural area, if you can imagine. These are all the people who came um, Polish, Irish, Yugoslavian, Czechoslovakian, you name it. They came through this area as their first uh, foray into the United States. Later on, there were a couple ways where Mexicans and African Americans, especially post World War II, uh, made their way into the area. So, we have a lot of old structures, old houses, such a rich history to talk about in this environmental center. So the blast, uh, U.S. Steel Blast Furnace Orchestra, um, and, and when, they were, when they were operating, according to Rod Seller, the local historian, they had about 15,000 employees. Can you imagine lunch break? You saw, there's actually a photo I didn't put in here. It's just you know, thousands of people crossing a bridge to get out of the facility to go eat lunch. This is the last furnace cruise in the 1920s at Wisconsin Steel. Okay, so more importantly, talking about wetlands. Uh, they were filled on a massive scale throughout the region. One of the first reasons was just to get the railroads through. Later on, they started realizing they had this byproduct called flag and they were going to create quote unquote usable land, you know, getting rid of the mosquito breeding uh, wetlands to create more land for more houses, more industry and more jobs. Uh, and this is actually, there's liquid uh, slag in here and they would just go and dump it over the edge. Here's a picture of them doing that. So when I say we have 3,900 acres of open space, some of our open spaces have 70 acres, 10 feet deep of slag. So, so when traditional restoration ecologists come to the region, some of them scoff and say, we don't want to deal with this. We can't get back to pre-settlement conditions. And we keep saying, what a great opportunity to, to learn from our past and try new things. Like John Marlin has Peoria sediments. Why not try that as an alternate soil growing medium uh, and plant in that? Or use biosolids blended with topsoil. You know, thinking creatively. Like we've made the, like, the landscape uh, a bit rough. Why not think of it as ecological lemonade? This is a Bob Case famous study of the fill materials of the whole region. He actually did extensive research to figure out what type of fill, whether it's slag, whether it's dredged spoils from the, the river systems, which were dumped extensively, um, whether it was biological sludge, ash, cinders, other byproducts, where they were deposited. So he can tell you by decade um, where they were deposited. He can tell you how deep they are. And, and uh, see, he has this wonderful map. It's actually one of the first projects I ever saw for Calumet done in GIS where you can really research these things. Again, rich history. So when you talk about the, the community impact on some of the uh, steel jobs being lost, 200,000 jobs is about the ballpark of, of lost uh, jobs in the region, according to Ron Sellers. And the landscapes look so different. Wisconsin Steel, this is what it looked like in its heyday in 1875, 1982. There's, there's nothing but a few building foundations left on the site. So the city is trying to deal with how do we bring back a developer to a site like this that needs to be remediated on such an extensive level. But it's happening. People want these big spaces in the urban areas. Our Department of Planning is doing a great job on that. This is U.S. Steel Southwards, one of the, it's just mind-blowing. Look at all these different rail lines coming in and out of here. Now there's just one rail line left and a giant ore wall that must be 30 feet. Thick, I think, and I don't even know how long the fire is. Half a mile. Thanks, Jen. Got some sediments out of that site. 
So on a positive note, when we think of the Calumet region, which is actually 10% of the city of Chicago, it has 60% of the city of Chicago's available industrial space. So we have all these huge opportunities for bringing back business, and now we want to do it greener. We want to bring back cleaner businesses, healthier businesses uh, to the region. We have all this infrastructure to handle huge vessels. Um, this is just a snapshot of, of business in the Calumet region. Lots of businesses <coughs> in business a long time. They provide lots of jobs. Uh, they use a lot of space. That's one of the big issues we have there. They, they do good, they get a lot of money, and they do a lot of regional and sometimes national and international uh, exporting. Ford Motor Company, one of the biggest in the area. Uh, they're literally right in the middle of our open space reserve. And they're a very strong partner, and that's why we're calling our building the Ford Calumet Environmental Center. They were, were one of the first to step up to the plate with a $6 million donation for the project. And their employees come out and volunteer to help us all the time. We have a really good relationship. This is just a list of some of the industrial groups in the area. And I love this quote. The community is this place of neighborhoods. They're shaped by ethnicity, social class, and a physical presence that implies industrial might. I like that. You feel that when you're driving through the region. So you can imagine we have some challenges when it comes to the natural resource management of these spaces. Gas flag, we've got dredge spoils, we have massive hydrologic changes caused by the railroads, roads, uh, and even beaver uh, coming through these areas. Um, they cause a lot of issues, these little critters. God bless them. Um, and a lot of dumping and off-roading, believe it or not, it's really sad if you drive through the area, there'll just be a huge pile of you know, mattresses or construction debris. It's an ongoing issue that the city's been battling. Um, so something we're trying to focus on. In terms of what's left, we have these, these on our scale, they're huge, uh, large ecologically significant wetlands. They provide habitat for 40% of the state listed flora and fauna, which is great. 11 sites are in the Illinois Natural Areas Inventory, so really good high quality places. Um, they've been selected as an important bird area by Audubon Society. Uh, and again, it's in this urban setting. What a great opportunity to bring kids in, talk about all this, uh, and teach them about how we can better, better approach the future. Bioblitz, uh, we were surprised at finding 2,300 different critters. I think there were even some mosses and others that got discovered in an area that had never been found. Uh, and I think we had about uh, over 100 scientists, including people from all the surveys, come out. And that was a really exciting event for us. Just some pictures from today. I, I like this slide because um, despite the fact that we don't think any of these things are really all that high quality, you know, John Ryder from Fish and Wildlife Service is always highlighting the importance of most people's connections with nature are with these species. And so, if, yes, even though we frown on them, maybe we don't like a lot of deer or, or uh, we don't necessarily want a lot of coyote, uh, to them, that's our way to get through to them about nature and ethics. This is the big man, the mayor. Out of Indian Ridge Marsh, the mayor, mayor Daly is very involved in this project, loves the Calumet region, and loves the critters. This is him looking at the black crown night here in Mercury. They stopped the trains for him, it was pretty funny. <laughs> Must be very important. Um, his his uh, guys protecting him from the police department were, they didn't seem so interested in birth, but the mayor was. Um, <laughs> and now we have, we have this huge opportunity for education. Um, we have new, huge opportunities for recreation. We do a lot of canoeing along the river. Lots of fishing goes on already. There's a bike path on the Vernon Greenway that we're connecting to the area. Um, and of course, volunteers. This is Marian Burns, if anyone knows her. She's kind of the matriarch of the environmental movement in the region. We, we get calls three or four times a week for people wanting to help with the county event. Lots of research going on. State surveys here heavily involved in much of that. Um, this is a, from Jeff's study. This is a nice picture of Maggie, who's now working at Shedd Aquarium. Uh, and the, God, this is us years ago. This is when we first started. Here's where we were yeah. right here in that picture. So this is a great place for an environmental center, we think. Uh, I guess zooming out a little bit, we have a land use plan um, so that these salmon, somewhat salmon colored places that you see on the map are forever more going to be industrial. And the greenish and yellow and other colors in there are going to be open space of different kinds. Some of them are maybe after a landfill is closed, we'll build a park on top of it. Um, or in other cases, it's an existing natural space that the city's buying. Uh, so this is, the industrial side is really so that we can protect this industrial corridor as one of the most important in the city. So Walmart and others can't come in. That's an approved plan by the city of Chicago. And then within the open space reserve, we identify all of our 3,900 acres. Uh, I have a report here if you want to take a look at it that goes through each of these properties in detail. 
detail. The goal being that the city will, in the short term, buy up some of these properties with eventual transfer to the Chicago Park District, Illinois DNR, or to uh, the Forest Preserve District of Cook County, depending on the site. These are just some of our sites that we deal with. Hegwish Marsh is where we're building the environmental center, it's about 140 acres. Indian Ridge Marsh, north and south, we picked those up through the tax reactivation program a few years ago. It's the cluster site, again, Mango Superfund. Uh, Biosound facility at MWRD has this great parcel called Dead Stick Pond, Lake County that itself is a conservation area. Big Marsh, the city hopes to close down that property in February. It's about 300 acres, the largest wetland in the whole region. Uh, and there's other adjacent existing parcels like Little Lake, I owned by DNR, Howard Horn and Eggers, owned by Forest Preserve District of Cook County. So the parcels are somewhat separated, but we want to manage them as an entire whole. You're not meant to read this, it's just to show a heck of a lot of people. When I say we, the collective we here. Okay. Again, we want to manage this as a whole. So for example, if we have black crown acres, we know that they are kind of finicky and depending on water levels and other conditions, they may move from site to site. So we want to make sure that in any given year when they fly in, they have somewhere to go. Um, so we want to maybe have uh, a habitat area at Big Marsh and a habitat area at Indian Ridge Marsh so that there's some flexibility and they can move around and need it and just been involved in lots of that work. Uh, we want to preserve the places that exist, improve all the habitats, we have lots of invasive species as you can imagine, and then the creation idea is is really that making ecological lemonade. So, you know, is slag mimicking an Alamar prairie type of habitat? What can grow there? What can we do with it? Uh, one of the things we, we studied was the hydrologic, uh, well, we created a hydrologic master plan of the region, and George was heavily involved in that, as well as Michael Miller, um, ISGS. And we just wanted to get that kind of big picture of what, what's going on with hydrology in this area, what can we improve, what needs to be improved. And that report took us about five years to develop. We were very excited to, to do that. And now it serves as the basis for some of our site-specific land management techniques. Again, you don't need to read this, but suffice to say there's tons of research going on. And so the scientists coming in and out, I mean, I, I just made this drive this morning. The people who are coming in the other direction to our meetings come all the time. We want to make their, uh, their work um, easier for them. And, and at the Environmental Center, we'll be doing a few things to, to make, it, make that so. We have an ecotox protocol. I won't go into this in, in too much detail, but suffice it to say, um, we had our plan staff years ago. We would draw our pictures saying, here's how we want Indian Ridge Marsh to look. We want to have our paths like this and the habitat areas like this. And DNR and others said, stop. You know, how do you know you're being protective of the critter's health? Like we know we, you know we have the TACO program for IEPA. We know how protective it is of human health. But how do we know that it's clean enough for the animals? And we said, well, heck, we don't know. Why don't you help us? That and it just it's just kind of we were spinning our wheels for a little while. So in, in the traditional Suzanne Malik style, she called everyone together and said, "Let's get through this." I remember George and Andrew and I saying, "I don't know if we can do this." Sitting on the phone saying, "Maybe we can't." Uh, but after uh, a couple years of meeting with regularity, we uh, came up with a protocol that now will just be used in the Calumet region. And it, it works so, it's somewhat like taco in that you have lookup tables. You do your sampling and then you look up how clean is clean enough for. Uh, soils, sediments, and surface water for these animals. And the technical team for this uh, ecotox group meets regularly to help us kind of sort through the sampling and figure out how to proceed on site plans. Okay, so, Eggwish Marsh. It's our key site we'll talk about. Um, it's about 130 acres. The city bought this parcel here from waste management. They had wanted to build a landfill on it years ago, and law won't let them anymore, so we bought it from them. We're buying this. That's taken us six years to buy this parcel from Norfolk Southern. That's where we're building the environmental center. So the railroads are, are challenging to deal with when it comes to land acquisition. And then MWRD, the Metropolitan Water Reclamation District, they technically don't sell their land. So we entered into a 39-year lease with them for that property that allows us to do all the restoration work that we want. So now we finally assembled this big piece of land. So when people visit the environmental center, they'll have not just this exciting building to look at, but also they'll be able to go hike out into the preserve check things out. And really neat views. Uh, this is a landfill right here. So when we head through the site and we end our tour nearly up here, people are astounded at the, you know, they don't ever get that close of a view of a landfill. Students, others think, what is a landfill? How is the trash in there? What a great opportunity to talk about our impact on nature. There's a two rail lines actually that run right here. Uh, so again, interpreting the, the railroad history of the region. Um, for facility is right across the way. And the O'Brien Lock and Dam and the Calumet River right, are right on the western edge. So great interpretive opportunities. Some photos of the site. This 
This is before we started our restoration work. Same thing, turtle. We take tours, I don't know, it feels like tw every other week we have a tour going on in the, in the area. We had an event in June where we just invited the public to come see how we're doing out there, and uh, we had 65 people turn up. We were very surprised at the size of the crowd. So, very quickly, we got a grant from Fish and Wildlife Service, $750,000, to do restoration on the site. We were beyond thrilled because it was finally a sizable enough chunk of money that we could get some things done. Uh, and the first things first, we're getting 140 piles of debris off the site. Cars that have been blown up, tires, sofas, mattresses, railroad ties, you name it, it's out there. And, and you know, it just created this visual uh, aesthetic that we, of course, didn't want to keep on the site. So I think we took uh, tires alone, there were two to three semis to remove from the site and recycle. Woody invasives, you pretty much couldn't see through the trees due to the buckthorn. Uh, so we, we had a very aggressive program to control that. Then we creatively decided to just reuse those chips on site to create our initial path system. Which you can see here, there was no path, and just kind of, there were off-road vehicle trails historically through the site. That's what we were using. So we wanted to grade them out, improve them, and put the chips down. And I think this gives a good impression of what it looked like before, a lot of buckthorn in there, and now it's incredible the difference, the before and after. These are some of the invasives we've been hitting. Then there's this fun idea of these vernal pools. Okay, so jokingly, this is Dave Boatlin, a lot of this came from uh, at, at Natural History Survey. So all these vehicles have been coming through for years and years. They go off-road, they create these huge ruts, they get their cars stuck. I mean, I don't know, it doesn't sound like fun to me, but to some, maybe it's really exciting. Um, <laughs> and uh, so they left all these big ruts along the, the path system, if you will, at the site. So when we were deciding where our paths would go, we said, what if we circumvent them and leave these, grade them out, and create, I know it's kind of silly calling them vernal pools, we call them, we jokingly call them ACB vernal pools. And we thought, well, let's just try a little, little experiment. And they have gone hog wild. We planted native plants in them. They're just teeming with life. And we never imagined what a great environment, like educational resource. Uh, the kids come and they look in there, we pull the critters out, we're able to lay them out. Uh, you know, beetles go here, crayfish go there, snails go there, and the kids are really learning about what's living in the water. It's just so much fun. This is them planting the first vernal pool, but luckily it wasn't too wet. And now the Chicago Public Schools are trying to adapt vernal pools individually, so it's been kind of this little whim of an idea that turned into something really fun. We just planted 300 trees on the, in November. Uh, we had over 50 volunteers come from four. We had three or four different schools come. I think we had the, the Northwestern University lacrosse team came out. I mean, it was crazy. All these people came to help us. And it was so much fun. Uh, and the, fish, the, excuse me, the Forest Service helped us with that project as well. So now these people are already calling saying they're going to come back and check on their, the tree they planted. So it's a great connection for them to the site. Me being a pyromaniac, I was really excited to let, light the whole place on fire, which we just did on November 10th. Um, and in the city, it was our first real burn done in this area, so we were pretty nervous. We didn't know how it would be received. And it went off without a hitch. Um, one of the only issues is that that main marsh did, didn't burn very well due to wind not being strong enough and the cattails not yet being dry enough. But uh, what a treat to see this happen. I mean, years of, of no burn management, and we're, we can't wait till next spring to see what comes up. We're also seeding right now. I think the last day of seeding was yesterday or today, something along those lines. And we're about to install a water control structure with a weird type of interface along the river so that we can pump water into the site to keep it high uh, as needed. That's about, it's going to cost about $200,000 through a supple, supplemental environmental project that we got. There's a business down there had a huge environmental violation, and US EPA helped get the funds for the positive environmental work to us. So let's talk about the center. Okay. Um, we have a couple facilities that are somewhat similar in the city. One of them is North Park Village Nature Center it's on the city's northwest side. It's visited by every single board in the entire city every year. When, you have, when they have a special event there, whether it be a harvest festival or something like that, it runs out of parking. It's total chaos. There's so much demand. It's, it's beyond clear that we need to do something more like that. Um, the Chicago Center for Green Technology is more of a green building, and it has a green building resource center. The U.S. Green Building Council is housed in that facility, uh, and Green Corps Chicago have a community gardening program there as well. Um, so it's a little bit of a different beast because most people are there for the building rather than the landscape. Uh, but these two 
facilities kind of combined and are together what will be our environmental center. So let's talk about it. It's not a very good photo here, but uh, years ago, uh, we had what's called an international green building design competition. We said, okay, we want to have the greenest building possible. Let's get all the ideas across the planet that we can possibly get to, to think creatively about how to do this. And we were just excited. We got 108 entries from seven different countries around the world. Um, and five finalists were selected. We put a jury into place, which will be on the next slide. Very high profile people, if you know the architecture field. People like Ralph Johnson and others, uh, very famous architects in the Chicago area, um, helped us to kind of go through these submittals. They did it blindly, so no, no submittal was marked with the actual architect or designer. So it was a real, real fair process. They selected five at the end, and those five, uh, for, they got 20 grand to further develop their concepts. And then in back in 2004 on Earth Day, we announced the winner, and we were really happy that it ended up being a local firm, Studio Gang Architects. And they've since uh, become quite famous working on some things with the 9-11 Memorial, other things in Europe. They're becoming known as one of the greenest designers in, in the city, if not the world. This, this was our team. I can just point out Jake Wesco from here now at U of I was our, our landscape representative for the group. Uh, and we, of course, had Marion Burns, the local resident, to ensure that someone from the region was helping make decisions for this. These were the finalists, in case you're interested. I don't know who knows a lot about architecture, but these are some pretty famous names in Chicago, at least. Um, and it was funny, Helmut Jan, most people know who he is. Uh, I, I knew that the jury was sitting there debating between adding him as the fifth person for the, to be a finalist or the student from the University of Tokyo. I just thought, whoa, how do you knew that he was competing with a student? He might not be too happy. <laughs> it's pretty funny. These are just for fun, some of the ideas that were put up about the building. Uh, Phil Ross Barney wanted to really just, she was so interested in the substrate of the, of the wrench coils from the river, maybe slag and other materials that may be in there, even debris, and just kind of lifting those and, and Gabby on baskets, making that be the roof of the building. Very creative idea, but there were some doubts about the structural integrity of the project. This is Brian Strong and Carlos Sierra. they had this ecology of foreign objects. These are all reused car hoods at one side of the building, reused telephone pole. And I cracked up because one of our colleagues said, this is kind of like the avocado refrigerator. It sounds like a good idea in the gear that, you know, the color is trendy, but then in 10 years, it may not be so cutting edge. So while it was really a respectable and creative submittal, they decided for that reason not to go with it. Um, Urban Lab created this loop system where they wanted to really play up a direct interface between the building and uh, and uh, the environment itself. Um, we weren't too excited. We don't want to have active recreation on the site, so that was, we don't want people skating out there. But a uh, very creative idea. You can see the green roof with people hiking up on top of it, uh, but just not exactly to, to our liking. This is the student from Japan. I think that they just picked him because, heck, what a crazy idea. And the building is actually built out of paper, which is used very commonly overseas. Um, and but you know, just didn't think it was going to be the best idea in the long run. This is the final winner, Jeannie Gang and Mark Schendel's design called Best Nest. And the building still, um, we've been going through the, the design stages, we're at design development stage now. The building still looks very much like this. So we're, we're thrilled. Schedule, we talk about it first. We hope to break ground next September. Open in late, of, late 09, it's probably more late fall now. Uh, and we have funds in place from Ford, as I mentioned, the state of Illinois, city of Chicago. We'll be raising additional dollars soon to get to our total. This is the entire team designing the building. So, site plan. So if you're familiar with the area, this is Torrance Avenue, and this is 134th Street. It's basically just an Army Corps of Engineers access route to the lock and dam over here. That will end up being our drive, main driveway. Uh, this will all be permeable paving, permeable concrete, permeable asphalt. We haven't finalized the exact product yet, uh, with the intention of everything being all the stormwater being returned directly to the system. Of course, you know, all the stops for the cars will be made out of recycled materials. Uh, the building is going to be complete platinum. Well, bus turnarounds, bike parking, galore. Uh, these are some of the spaces. What's important to note here is the whole building is about 27,000 square feet. And this piece here, this lighter gray element, is a is a 10,000 square foot porch. And when you look at the <coughs> building a minute ago, this is really that south south face. And this porch here is 10,000 square feet. We really want people to spend a lot of time outdoors in that area. Um, inside, I'll go through some of these spaces. So this is generally the office space. 
the laboratory space. This is an exhibit area about 5,000 square feet. We also will have an orientation room where we'll watch a video about the cabinet meeting, kind of setting the context of why we're here. Some classrooms and an auditorium. One of the latest models of the building. Again, these are those key spaces. I mentioned this one. We'll have exhibit spaces that are both permanent and temporary. The exhibits are just going to focus on coexistence, nature, industry, and community. And a lot of people in this room are helping us develop content for that. We'll have two classrooms, each seating about, I think, 35 kids. One of them will be able to be just completely hosed down, get the kids messy, you know, have them out in the wetland in their boots and waders. Feel free to come in. We'll be able to clean up easily at day's end. Whereas the other one will be more traditional education with computers and those types of facilities for their use. We'll also have a children's room over at one of our other centers. It gets used very heavily. Parents and toddlers, you know, they're maybe two, they're maybe three, but they really want to have a place to sit down, read a book about nature, play with some toys involving nature. And so we want to be able to provide that for them there. Of course, we'll have staff offices. We expect to have about, we have space for nine full-time staff. Only four of those will be from the city of Chicago, and we're really interested in talking to DNR and other partners about possibly having staff be placed at the site to help with programming and other things. So if anyone has any ideas like that, just call me. Uh, and laboratory and bunks, uh, this is, uh, Dave Boltland kept talking about this as well. We wanted to have a lab, of course, for the scientists, like many of the folks in this room. So when you come up, you have a place to work. You have a locker to lock your things in. You can leave your equipment for the week if you'd like to. Um, and Mark has ha helped um, me shape this room over time. And then one of the really important things that Dave Boltland wanted to have was a bunk room, because you guys come up and you don't have anywhere to stay, or the hotels are kind of expensive. What a waste of resources. So we'll at least have four bunk beds now available in that room so you can come stay overnight. Again, encouraging people to come do their research in this area. The auditorium will seat 230 people, a real flexible space. So we'll have tables like this that you can put up or take down, put it around, put whatever you want. Uh, so you can have all kinds of different events there. And out in the back, we'll have a shed where we have you know, the waders and, and wheelbarrows and other site management equipment. Remember for the platinum, excuse me, says plus plus. Area beyond the top points of uh, platinum, so we're pretty excited. One of the main themes is again this connection to outdoors. We'll have lots of tables outside each of the classrooms, the auditorium, everything will open up to the space. So if you're giving a special event, you can just pop right outside and engage with nature. This is a, an old rendering of the auditorium. It doesn't really look like this anymore, but um, again, from each room, you'll be able to see the preserve. The glass is still in place. We want to use recycled steel from Calumet throughout the building because it's part of the story of Calumet. It's part of that idea of coexistence. So we're doing extensive research into uh, reclaimed steel, and we're already finding beams that are the appropriate size. We're going to start warehousing those soon uh, for use in the structure. We also have these weird pieces where a business may, you know, they may need a shape like this. They punch it out of the steel, and then they leave this remnant that can't be used. And so we're trying to look at some of the regularly produced shapes and say, can we use this as some of our fencing? How can we reuse this throughout the site? Most of the big beams that we're going to get, you'll see the powder used as structural supports, uh, are coming from the region, and they will be stamped with the original manufacturer. Again, this whole story to be able to see Acme Steel, Republic Steel, U.S. Steel in the Environmental Center. This is just a shot of, you know, we want to take the recycled rebar and make it into a woven nest on the exterior of the building. Uh, this, it makes it kind of look like a bird nest. The design is a little bit different now. We've been doing a lot of research on, um, on how to protect birds from colliding with buildings, and that's informing the, the, the actual pattern of this. You can see these beams here. These are the big steel beams. They're being piled driven into the ground, and they're the main supports for the building and the slab. Reclaimed wood, the only remaining uh, wood mill left in the city is right down the street in the Edwish neighborhood. Uh, so we've been already talking to them about using their wood. And we want to use, re reuse it wherever possible. For example, when you pour concrete for ceilings, usually you would uh, take this formwork and take it down and dispose of it somewhere. Well, why not just leave it up? Why not just put a finish on it? So just thinking about reducing waste, sustainable ideas, huge part of the project. So we, have, we know we have a ton of slack. George has always been saying, how can we mine all that slack out of Big Marsh? It should be a resource. Um, and we said, well, you know, let's take some of it and build um, tiles. So our whole floor for the entire facility will be made with recycled slag combined with colored glass. So this is just a sample that we made. It's this really vibrant design, if you will, 
And this is just going to be the substrate throughout the whole facility. We'll have some interpretation talking about where this lag is from and where the glass is from. I mentioned bird protection as a key part of the design here. You know we're on the, the migratory pathway uh, in Calumet. You can see there's right smack down in the middle of it. We have a lot of responsibility on our hands to not have this happen. This is actually our birds from New York in one day around just one building. Uh, we don't want this to happen. And this architectural firm has been working a lot with researchers on how to keep birds from flying in the building. They actually held one of the first conferences in Chicago on this subject about two years ago. We have 23 endangered birds at the marsh. We don't need them. Smack in the building. So part of the reason they use that mesh exterior that you saw with the steel is simply to create a visual barrier for the birds. And so uh, they're working with Daniel Clem, a professor, and he's with Purdue, so I believe. Uh, and he's designing, you know, how tight does that mesh have to be? Because people put those little stickers up on the window, you know, that have a bird on it or whatever. We know that that doesn't work unless they're put tightly enough together. So uh, he's helping them design the screen so that it absolutely should be protective of the birds. Originally in the design, the glass was angled downwards also to reflect the ground rather than the sky. And because of the design of the mesh, they know now that they won't have to do that. That's a cost savings for us in the building. Again, keeping the building sustainable, we want to manage it in zones as appropriate. So when staff are here, this zone will be open during the day. The exhibit zone will also be open as people just make their way through the facility. You know, and we may have the auditorium zone closed off if there's no special event. We don't want to be heating and, and cooling parts of the building that don't need to be. It's just an efficient thing. We're going to have 10 wind turbines on the roof of the building, all produced, we think, in Chicago. Uh, and, and their general goal is not only to produce a lot of electricity, but to help exhaust the building, because we really won't have much air conditioning in this building. We want to keep that to a minimum. Um, so these are going to be amazing turbines on the roof. And there are, they are protective of birds. They're a design that's been approved uh, by the Audubon Society and others. Many of you are probably familiar with geothermal heating and cooling systems. We will have those. Um, <coughs> generally, all it is is you know, underground, the Earth's temperature is pretty constant, around 50 some degrees. Uh, so in the summer, why not have a pipe going through there that can actually um, cool things down and bring it back up into the building? And in the winter, the opposite, helping you provide warm air to the facility. So lots of buildings are starting to have these in Chicago. Uh, the geothermal tubes, they go in uh, for Berkeley, excuse me, these are about 450 feet below the Earth's surface. So we'll have a whole uh, slew of them over here and possibly over here. Then we're adding this system called Earth Tubes, which as far as we know haven't been done in the city of Chicago or maybe Madison. Here Madison may have one of the other buildings in the region. Um, they get laid horizontally. And, and, and geothermal uses a liquid that has some kind of anti-freeze in it, uh, whereas Earth Tubes are really just using air. They're heating the air. And then the air gets serviced into the building and filtered as appropriate with UV and things like that. Um, so this is just a great system that we want to put in place. And you see this, these lines here. This is um, the former river channel, as I showed in one of those earlier slides. So we want to do some kind of interpretation so when people are walking above the ground in the earth tube area, they know they're above this amazing system. And in fact, this used to be the river channel. We plan to have a biomass boiler. It's one of the cleanest burning uh, boilers uh, possible to buy on the market these days. Our engineers looking at all the modeling of how much energy it can produce and, uh, and what we, when, when and how we get the chips. Um, and so this is going to be a great system. I don't think a lot of places have them in the city of Chicago, uh, but we're, we're thrilled. It's a way for us to use our coal and bases. Uh, the park district also has just tons and tons of mulch and for Bureau of Forestry for that matter. Uh, we need places to, to incinerate these and produce energy at the same time. Solar is kind of passe now, but it's going to be a big component of the roof of this building. We're getting integrated panels that, uh, that are part of the roof because we want to collect all the rainwater that we possibly can, and they don't interfere with that. Our plans for AC and the desiccant wheel are changing right now, but generally uh, we'll have other systems in place to really help reduce humidity, which I had no idea that so much of the percentage of need for air conditioning comes from just the need to take down the humidity. Uh, so we're looking at alternative means to do that so that we don't have to rely very heavily at all on air conditioning. These are just some scenarios looking at the winter and summer. Um, that porch that we have, the angle of it is being designed such that in the summer, it will, or excuse me, in the winter, it will maximize the amount of sunlight reaching the ground surface of the building. We'll have the earth tubes um, 
temporary and cold air underground, bringing in warmer air into the into the facility. It's coming in from the, from the floor, actually, rather than from the roof. Um, we'll also have um, radiant floor heating. Uh, we also have biomass boiler operating and providing electricity as well as that heat to the floor. Skylights um, are strategically placed throughout the building, again, with these angles such that they're catching the summer and winter sun, sun in different uh, ways to help with the building's function. And kind of the opposite happens in the summer. We're rejecting that really heavy sunlight. We're bringing in cool air through the earth too. Geothermal is working hard to provide cool water for us. And the biomass boiler is really only providing electricity in the, in the summertime. Okay. This idea of a night purge is really going to be important in the summer. Getting that hot air that's built up over the day out of the facility. So one of my favorite part, parts of the building is this uh, living machine wetland. It's a patented system. Um, in essence, we'll collect all the stormwater coming off the roof in a big underground long um, cement tube uh, that can hold about 24,000 gallons of water. That's going to feed into the toilets. And then the toilets, of course, the solids will go out into somewhat of a septic kind of storage tank for periodic cleaning and removal by truck, traditional means. But the water, uh, once it comes out of the toilets, is going to go into what we call this living machine wetland. It's going to be about a 25 by 25 foot room. It's like encased in glass. Uh, and it'll have just a series of plants and bacteria and other critters helping to break down the water in stages. I remember in grad, in, excuse me, in undergrad, uh, someone was doing their, their master's thesis, watching them do this, uh, simply just taking barrels of water and cleaning filthy water and then having it come out clean, and it works. Uh, this is going to be a massive change for the city of Chicago. It's uh, you know not very often that we want to say, we don't even want to connect to the sewer and try and get a variance for it. So this this, this building, and especially this system, is very hard for us. Our code people are becoming greener over time, but it's, it's something that's in process. So uh, we hope to not connect to the sewer system. Excuse me. That's the living machine. Um, and that's pretty much, much it about the building. I wanted to open up the floor to questions. Does anybody have anything? Sure. I've heard about the Zerkheim monitoring stations out there. You're what? The monitoring stations out there. What are all the monitoring stations? If they're in the main marsh, they're different. Is that where all of them are? No, there's no, one that's out on the south. Yeah, the if it's on Norfolk Southern or MWRD, it's different. Oh, okay. Only the 100-acre parcel there. Yeah. So the 27,000 square foot, is that never grows? For the? For the facility. I, I, think, I think it's gross. And what was, what was the total cost of the six? We don't have a total cost of the building yet. We're, because we're still in the design development stage, they're still kind of truthing, if you will, some of the systems. And we're kind of working back, saying, you know, years ago when they had a conceptual idea for putting the steel piles in, they're having to revise those because of the realities from the geotech sampling that we have. Well, one of the things I was thinking about is the National Great Urban Research and Education Center is also a building with a green laboratory building sure. of about this size. It's going to have a living machine. A lot of the same features. Really? So, That's one of the and they have a living machine. Well, it's designed for What's your construction to get? They may be going out for this. We'd love to find out more. Yeah. Okay. Great. Yeah, um, it, on a different kind of looking at the big picture, obviously that area was vibrant industrial area, lots of jobs, but it wasn't sustained. Partly because I guess uh, the pollution, you know, contaminated the environment there, but also industry didn't modernize or change with the times. So I guess as you look forward, how are you, how's the city approaching the long-term question of not only sustaining the environmental quality, but also the economy of the region and keeping industry vibrant and current. That's a really good question. I think WMRP has been involved in some of that as well, but there's a there's a new there's two new projects in in Chicago in this area of Chicago. One of them is just green business. That's really more of the whole city is trying to get all the businesses that are doing anything green to just talk to one another, share ideas, and spread the word, if you will, about sustainability. And it's been way more of a success than we ever anticipated. People are begging to get in to learn more. Um, and then in, the, in this region in particular, we have uh, what's called the Waste to Profit Network. And again, that's really what 
WMRC was helping with as well, kind of identifying all these different waste streams that different facilities are producing, telling other people about what they have, talking about how they can be reused to create other products, save costs, save time, and of course, reduce pollution. Um, we, there's also a lot more scrutiny when businesses are planning to come to the city. Uh, our Department of Planning really reviews their their ideas in much more detail. We don't want more, you know, waste transfer facilities. We don't. We have enough of those. I mean, the Tenth Ward has, I think, 680 acres of landfills alone. It's just so disproportionate and unfair. Uh, so they're trying really hard to make sure the systems that come in are green. We have something called Calumet Design Guidelines, really forcing them to do. Uh, plantings and other uh, landscaping techniques that make sense in the Calumet region. And in January, we'll also have a new city stormwater ordinance, so all businesses coming in have to do pretty serious on-site management of stormwater, what whether in Calumet or what elsewhere in the city of Chicago. Um, and our planning department is getting much greener over time, and they're tired of seeing the same old ideas come through. They want to see businesses uh, like, I know there's a potentially a, a biofuel facility coming in to buy Republic Steel. Uh, there's another business that I can't talk about all of them, but uh, coming in that does a lot of um, supplies, supplying places like Menards, but they want to start talking about uh, ways to make things more green and more efficient. And everybody, the, what you feel at these meetings, we had a sustained 10th sustainable business summit was just excitement that they, people didn't know five years ago that any of these things were possible, and now they're completely changing their businesses and in the end saving themselves lots of money and helping the environment. So we hope over time we'll be getting better. And Suzanne, our commissioner, is heavily invested in making that happen uh, in conjunction with the new commissioner of planning. So I think more is to come. As a naive country pumpkin, I always wonder about security and access issues. <clears throat> and so the big question in particular, and even I think in your smart department, will access be controlled? Can you just pull up and go very and six a.m. or 10 p.m. Well, right now you can at all of the sites, as you know. Um, eventually, we'll have to have a lot more control. Uh, what we don't want to happen is at North Park Village Nature Center, one of the park district sites, they fence the whole thing in, and now they have 52 deer on, I think, like 20 acres or something like that. And then the public won't let them call the herd. So we have to be very cognizant of making sure the animals can get in and out. Uh, but here, I suspect we'll be doing some sort of various warrants is being redone. I think you know that. Uh, they're going to be going 35 feet below grade, so that will shut off a lot of the access from Torrance Avenue. We'll have a locked gate, though, at the entryway, so that will lock the facility at day's end. I don't know if we'll put fencing around the whole site, because we have railroad rooms and other things that are kind of natural deterrents, but we may have to, like I know the off-roaders, when we locked up the site, we have a couple cable gates now. They just come in over the railroad and they have been down this really steep edge and come in, so we just put a giant pile of trees that we had cut down there. And, I think it's going to be a lot of learning as we go, rather than sensing the whole site and finding the, those spot areas that are risky. So, but yeah, we have to do some security. But in the end, the people will want to be able to access during certain hours. The center, Generally, like High Wish will be the first one, but you know, a lot of these sites will take years, maybe five, ten years, really, to get set up. So you'll still be able to go to Indian Ridge anything you want, and since I know you, I might like you. <laughs> 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 yeah, but general. I mean, burgers and others are going to know how to do this. But yeah. yeah first of all. So then this facility is going to be located right next to the uh, new Ford plant, the new divisions, right along at the OO? No, that's the supplier part, but it's very close to there. So if you come down, if you go, uh, if you're at Avenue O and 126, where the supplier part kind of all those buildings are along that route, if you go west along that and south on Torrance, we're just south of 130th. So we're really close to that whole complex. Are there any plans to make any like satellite center at some of the sites like Big Marsh or the New York? I mean, once you acquire that, is there? Yeah. I, I mean, you'll have a map at, at Hegwish showing all the other sites, I assume, somehow, or in the brochure or something. Then when people go there, or? Like Indian Ridge Marsh, I guess, is a good example. That's it's going through the Army Corps process, Section 1135. They have to provide up to $5 million to restore the sites that they dumped dredge spoils all over it. Um, and that's one of the biggest interest sites because the Black Rock Engineering Reverie is there. 
And so we've been talking about having perhaps just a small parking area so that people can get there. Of course, we'll have a brochure showing here's how you get to these multiple sites and here's how to check them out safely. Because a lot of these places have heavy truck routes flying by. It's not easy to just park on the shoulder. So we'd like to do it. You know, it's things like in Newbridge Marsh, there's a little hot spot. We'll probably have a barrier, engineered barrier, and it'll be a parking lot right there. You know, things like restrooms may be a little bit more challenging because a lot of the area has has uh, problems with getting uh, utilities and other things to it. Um, but in the long run, we would like to have not necessarily another building, but a comfort amenity and trail. Still on parking. Right. 